All right. So I'm Bonnie Pulsewaite. I'm the Dean of the Emeritus College and very happy to see everybody here today. We have some special guests. There are students from Jacob's class and we want to welcome them. Uh, there are goodies in the back of the room if you're hungry or thirsty. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to welcome uh, Professor <clears throat> Jacob Wagner to our program today. He's going to be talking about affordable housing, which is a really important topic, at least in my mind, I hope in everyone else's mind. Um, he's also the founding faculty member for the Center for Neighborhoods, which is a very interesting initiative that the university has going. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here with the introduction, so I'm going to turn it over to Jacob so he can inform us on affordable housing. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Let's see if you all can hear me if I... Put this on my lapel. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see everyone and the folks at home. I know there's a few folks at home. Okay. All right. So uh, Jacob Wagner here from the newly restructured Division of Natural and Built Environment in the School of Science and Engineering. Uh, formerly of the College of Arts and Sciences, now moved over to this new division and the faculty founder of the UMKC Center for Neighborhoods, as Dean Bonney said. And today what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about our approach, what we've been doing uh, in architecture, urban planning and design, how we approach our research, teaching and outreach with the community. Talk about what is affordable housing, our small apartment study that we did for the city. And then we can discuss, as I'm sure you all have lots of comments about housing. Uh, I did want to dedicate today uh, to Ted Seligson, who was an architect who passed away in 2021. He was my colleague, uh, and and Ted was really such a leader and intellectual. I just wanted to take a moment to remember Ted uh, as we get into this topic. He helped us uh, adapt and move into the to the Cats building, and he was actually working for the firm that did the building back in the 60s when it was first built. So that was kind of a cool full, full circle moment for us with Ted. And we miss him every day uh, in at, at Cats Hall. No. Hit the next slide. You can go ahead and hit the next slide. So it doesn't take uh, a day or two to hear something about affordable housing in Kansas City, right? So um, all you have to do is turn on the news, turn on KCUR, look at the paper, look at your local favorite blogger, and certainly affordable housing is a topic, a major issue in Kansas City today. All kinds of opinions and all kinds of uh, attitudes about what is affordable. The, the, the main definition, of course, uh, in terms of what is affordable housing depends on somebody's income and their family size and where they live. And it's generally determined by what, what metropolitan area you're in. And the house, housing urban uh, development, the federal agency, basically defines what's affordable housing for different geographies throughout the country. And if you are paying less than 30% of your uh, income, on housing, then you're not experiencing a cost burden. If you're spending more than 30% of your income, your gross income on housing, then you are experiencing a housing, bur housing burden. And if you are paying more than 50% of your income on housing, it's considered a severe housing burden, a cost burden, whether you're a renter or an owner. Uh, and so that's how affordable housing is determined uh, in this country. And so it's not surprising that people disagree on what an affordable housing unit is, because clearly it's based on uh, a lot of different variables. Uh, but what we look at in Kansas City is the challenge of defining it 
And often where the controversy is, is defining affordable housing in the context of development incentives, right? So if we're going to incentivize new development, what then should people be paying for housing in those particular units, right? And that's often where the politics uh, become an issue. Would you like me to walk over and advance the slides? I don't mind. At the moment, I need to stop. There we go. Okay, fair enough. It is. It is. No, that's a different metric. That's a different metric. So uh, whether someone is defined as low income, a low income household, depends on the area median income for the particular region. So the challenge there is the area median income for the metro area is much higher than the, the area median income for the city. And so oftentimes we're using a regional metric uh, where there are many more suburbs that are much more well off in terms of income. And uh, they are affecting then what is considered the area median income for the city. Thank you so much. So I wanna to talk today about the connection between the Center for Neighborhoods, the work we do with neighborhoods in Kansas City and the work that our students here are doing uh, right now with the South Roundtop and of course our research as well. Uh, we have a studio-based pedagogy, so we teach our students to focus on design, uh, which is very important in terms of uh, where the profession is going right now. And the work with neighborhoods, as they, they will probably tell you themselves, is a crash course on how to be a planner, how to respond to the public, how to, to do practical research for issues here in Kansas City. Uh, and so each of these students that's joined us today is currently working on a project uh, and there are many other opportunities, internships and other opportunities where our students work directly with neighborhood leaders in the city. Uh, the Center for Neighborhoods has worked with over 225 leaders in the last six years. So we usually have a fall and a spring class. Those, those cohorts or leadership program cohorts are offered for free because many of our neighborhood leaders, they're already working. They're already, they're volunteering to help their neighborhood be a better place. We've had over 100 unique community partnerships in the last six years. And uh, we're currently doing cohort 11 every Tuesday night across the street at Cats Hall. This is what it looks like. We wanna make sure our students are engaged with neighborhood leaders in issues that affect neighborhoods in Kansas City. So it's sitting down and working through issues on a block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood level. This is from the Blue Hills neighborhood just over here east of campus. Uh, just a few years ago, students working with the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association, getting practical experience while they're in class. This is our current cohort 11. So we're working with a number of neighborhoods in Kansas City, Missouri. This was the kickoff night. This is LaMonica Upton. She's our outreach coordinator at the Center for Neighborhoods. So we have a whole team at the Center for Neighborhoods to work with neighborhood leaders because really neighborhood issues, they don't take a break. They don't take summer off, their evenings and weekends. So it's really a full-time job, even though these folks are volunteers who are just volunteering to help make their neighborhood a better place. We have four pillars for our Center for Neighborhoods curriculum, and these relate directly to the work we do with our students, and they're an extension of our academic mission. So they are leadership and governance. Most neighborhood associations are a project in local self-governance, so they need to have bylaws, they need to have ways to resolve conflict. They may or may not have dues depending on if it's an HOA or a neighborhood association, but they have all kinds of leadership issues, including how to continue to build their team so they can address the challenges that they face. Planning and development, of course, coming out of a planning department, you'd expect us to address uh, planning issues. That's really where housing and affordable housing fits in. 
technology and communications. We've seen over the last 20 years a revolution in what we call e-governance, the movement a lot of things that used to be done in person and with paperwork are now all entirely online. And so neighborhood leaders need help to find that information, to find how city government functions in this era where everything's on a website, an app, et cetera. And then finally, health and safety. We know that neighborhoods are a huge part of health disparities. We know that people experience things like housing conditions that are they're not in isolation. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had a reminder of that. There was a house in our neighborhood that caught fire and burned and it's been sitting vacant and they've been you know getting around to demolishing it but uh, imagine if that house was there you know not for a few weeks but for years right so how does that affect the neighborhood in terms of neighborhood health safety we, we want to address issues of crime and violence in the context of safety because we really see crime and violence as a public health issue just as much as a or even more than an issue of uh, criminal justice so those are our four pillars for the Center for Neighborhoods, and they sit on a foundation of social and racial equity. We recognize when we're talking about neighborhoods in Kansas City, we're already talking about race, even if we haven't brought up the word, based off where people live in the history of the city. Asset-based community development. We're focusing on building neighborhoods from the inside out, recognizing the strengths of the neighborhoods, the leadership, the people who are, who are there, the skills, gifts, and talents that people have to contribute to make their neighborhood a better place. Restorative justice, again, uh, focusing on ways to address issues, resolve the problem. It doesn't help to give somebody a fine for not fixing up their porch. If they didn't have money to fix up their porch in the first place, they're not going to have money to pay the fine, right? So the punitive model that we're seeing is less and less productive. And fortunately, the city and the codes department are starting to see the importance of addressing these issues uh, in a more restorative fashion. And then the community capitals framework, recognizing that sometimes you do need financial capital, sometimes you need money, but sometimes you need other forms of capital, like social capital. People are disconnected. They don't understand how things work at City Hall. Or you know, recognizing the environmental capital in a neighborhood. Uh, the trees, the way that the tree canopy can help reduce urban heat island effect. These kinds of things fit in what we call the community capitals framework. So that's really the foundation for what we do at the Center for Neighborhoods. I encourage you to check out our website. Lots of good stuff on there. Center for Neighborhoods. Uh, you can find it pretty easily online. Okay, so the topic for today, what is affordable housing? As I mentioned earlier, it's all over the place in the local news these days. Uh, our work was picked up in terms of the small apartment survey. I'll talk a little bit about that. You've probably heard of, of the KC Tenants Group really pushing the mayor and council to make some progress on rent stabilization and housing quality for renters. We know that our own congressman is often involved in efforts to get funding to Kansas City. So this is a, a recent initiative by LISC. LISC is also helping to fund our work we're doing in South Round Top, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, over in Prairie Village, big controversy as the city considers zoning changes that would allow more diversity in the housing stock. So I'll talk about that as well. Uh, and of course, uh, lost in the middle of this is, is the younger generation of folks who are uh, really facing the cost pressure of increasing rents and a lack of increasing wages. Okay, so as I said earlier, affordable housing is really defined by HUD, right? By housing and urban development. And so if the occupant is paying more than 30% of their income for housing costs, they're experiencing some kind of a housing cost burden, whether you are a renter or an owner. So a severe cost burden is 50% or more of your income. And the number of Americans who are experiencing both a cost burden or severe cost burden has uh, gone through the roof in the last 10 years. Area median income, we were talking about that earlier, that is set for the region. So the Kansas City, uh, KCK, KCMO, our metropolitan area, uh, the AMI is used to determine 
uh, what kind of housing are, am I eligible to access in terms of different kinds of affordable housing? It's also how we uh, address housing subsidies. So sometimes the subsidy is going to the developer to keep the housing unit affordable. And sometimes the subsidy is going directly to the renter or household to help them purchase the housing. We, we have different kinds of housing programs for both those kinds of affordability. It is adjusted by the location. So where are you? And by the size of your family, right? So it's there's a whole metric on area median income in terms of how we determine affordable housing in Kansas City. Now, housing is, is probably one of our more complex areas of public policy because we see it as a human right. Since 1949, Congress and the 1949 Housing Act recognized that housing was a human right and that everyone needed access to housing. Uh, unfortunately, we have a massive homelessness crisis, right? And so this, our ability to, to achieve that human right uh, is significantly lagging. At the same time, housing is also a real estate investment, a very important part of our economy, locally, statewide, nationally, in terms of investment. So this balance between social good versus a vehicle for financial wealth creation based off rents, that's the central conflict. And that conflict has gone back. Uh, it's intensified as more and more people have gotten involved in this side of the equation here, which really opened up in the 1960s and intensified in the 1980s. And real estate investment has become a huge area of growth over the last 50 years in terms of the U.S. and the global economy. It impacts all forms of governance, right, from your neighborhood association all the way up to the federal government. What's happening with housing affects all kinds of different issues, right? The U.S. Treasury, very involved in housing. The tax code is a huge form of housing policy. We don't necessarily think of it like that, but it is very much a housing policy tool in terms of how we deal with uh, things like a second home, things like, you know, uh, mortgage breaks on your mortgage, what you're paying on your mortgage in terms of tax write-offs. So housing really impacts all levels of governance and it doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? We know housing costs are in the context of transportation costs in our region because people have to commute. They often have to commute by an automobile. So now they have a housing cost plus the transportation costs and that affects affordability as well. Increasingly around the world, though, we're recognizing that housing is a human right. And so how do we, how do we address that, uh, both nationally and internationally? Here in Kansas City, of course, we have the legacy of redlining. And this is the map of the Homeowners Loan Corporation, the residential security map from 1939. And I put this up here because oftentimes people talk about redlining, but they don't understand the map or they've never seen it. How many folks have seen this before? Anybody? Okay, my students, all hands up. Okay, good. Uh, everyone else, you get a pass, my students. Uh, so, so this really began the association with race and diversity of a neighborhood and risk. And so if you look at the, the way that the categories, the first grade was green and it was an A, and that was mostly the country club district, which was emerging south of the country club plaza here and into both Missouri and Kansas, the state lines right about here. So you see much of Johnson County, Kansas was unbuilt at the time. There were a few places that were mapped out, but the majority of this was the developed part of Jackson County, and of course, the developed part of Kansas City, Kansas. The second grade was blue, listed as B, third grade C, and then the red line districts in red uh, listed as the most uh, risky places. What's amazing to me about this map is that in 1939, many of these places were less than 20 years old. The houses that were built, there was a huge building boom uh, in the late 1920s in Kansas City. So if you look at when most of Brookside all the way up towards uh, what we call uh, the historic Northeast here, a lot of this housing actually really wasn't that old. 
at the time. There was a huge uh, building boom between the two wars, especially in the, uh, the, the late 1920s. There was a lot of capital, a lot of construction, a lot of work going on, and this massive production of affordable bungalow houses that uh, in many ways uh, are still in great shape today. Sure thing, sure. So campus is right here. So we're right here in this on, you know, uh, and then truce would be right, right there. So what's interesting is truce really wasn't the line that we see it, it that it became later. That was really in it, the first time you see truce become a racial divide is actually in the 1970 census. And it was that change between 1960 and 1970 where a lot of neighborhoods changed in Kansas City. So you really don't see it here. What you see here, though, is the emergence of this new business model. And you see this J.C. Nichols model of suburbanization is emerging here and getting the green light by the financial industry, while other neighborhoods uh, that are well established and the homes were as large and beautiful like the historic Northeast, were either redlined or, or certainly not in that first class. So very important, this was obviously, these maps were done uh, throughout the country and you can find them these days pretty easily online. I wanna talk a little bit about our small apartment survey and study. Uh, one of the things we talk a lot about when we're working with the students is units and structure. And units and structure is simply the number of housing units under one roof or in a, in a singular building. And most uh, residential housing in the United States, the single family home, a detached single family home on its own lot is kind of the standard uh, suburban home uh, throughout the United States. That really became the, the model that after the 1920s, that becomes kind of the pinnacle of residential development. But a lot of the neighborhoods we work with, that's only one kind of housing unit. And so uh, just a few years ago, around 2019, 2020, we were asked by the director of the Kansas City, Missouri Housing Department to do a study of the small apartment buildings from two units to 19 units in the Central City Economic Development District here in Kansas City, Missouri. And what's important about this is that these neighborhoods were built at a time when that was the standard. So a lot of the neighborhoods here that you'll see that were redlined were the neighborhoods that we surveyed. And what's distinguishing about them is they have a very diverse housing stock. Whereas as we move over into Johnson County, Kansas, you get less and less of that housing diversity and more single family only. And this is the issue at, at, at stake right now with the argument in Prairie Village about the zoning changes is all almost all of Johnson County is really either zoned for single family or apartment buildings, and there's really nothing in between. When we go out and work with neighborhoods and students, one of the great things about working with students is we can go out and survey the whole neighborhood. Ask these four great minds here what we've been doing for the last several months. We've been going out and surveying every single house in the neighborhood we're working in now. This is some past work that we did just across the street here in what's called Trucewood, part of the 4963. We identified not just the housing uh, units and structure, but also the housing types. So you'll see bungalows, prairie homes, craftsman homes, and four squares, a number of classic Kansas City uh, housing types. But we also looked at the different kinds of uh, what we call small apartment buildings, anything from a duplex to a colonnade to family flat, all the way up to the smaller uh, multifamily structure. And then we map those out where they are in the neighborhood by type. And this is what's called the missing middle. So the, the detached single family home really became over the 20th century, the pinnacle of American housing policy. The goal was to get as many households into a single family home as possible with the idea that home ownership was very beneficial to the, to the country. It was a great way to build wealth. It was a great way to stabilize property values. All these things really are rooted back in the development of both J.C. Nichols, but taking that to a national level with the Urban Land Institute, uh, and other really pro single family home policies that we saw in the 20th century. And most places that are mostly suburban, 
are going to have single family homes or they'll have some kind of apartment buildings. And that's about it. And that's why this middle housing here is called the missing middle because it's been missing for the last, uh, you know, at least 50 to 75 years. It really hasn't been keeping up in terms of construction because we've shifted to building either all single family or apartment buildings uh, and, and really nothing in between. Uh, that's certainly the case in much of Johnson County, Kansas. You have one or the other. But here in Kansas City, Missouri, we have all of this throughout the neighborhoods. It's just historic. We don't have to put it back in. The challenge is how do we conserve what we have? And as I'll show you here in our research, it's certainly a threatened and unique form of housing that if we don't put more resources into it, we are going to lose this housing diversity in Kansas City. So this debate over the missing middle is very controversial in the suburban communities that don't have it. And, you know, the efforts, whether it's in uh, outside of D.C. or outside of Kansas City, it's the same same conversation, right? When you're going to put the housing back in, there's a whole controversy around those small multifamily units. Our work here in Kansas City, Missouri, we didn't have that problem. The housing's already there. It was built in originally as part of the diversity of housing stock in many neighborhoods. We mapped out all the buildings. We did a field survey of all the properties. We looked at building permits and other data that the city has in open data. We analyzed 311 and other codes, whether there were complaints or healthy homes. And, and then we combined that more quantitative information with the focus groups and interviews. And that was absolutely critical. And we were able to do them on Zoom. This was in 2020 and 2021, we were doing this work. We talked to tenants landlords and owners of these properties, real estate property managers, and neighborhood leaders to get a perspective on what's going on with these small apartment buildings. So he'll, here you'll see both the photos that we took. This is a, a four family flat here. They always have good names, by the way, the Matilda. I mean, who wouldn't want to live in the Matilda, right? Uh, this is a two family flat that was boarded up and vacant at the time. A uh, beautiful brick building, certainly uh, very easily can be restored and brought back to life. And then this is the neighborhood these two are in. Uh, this is Benton Boulevard here, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But these are scattered throughout this neighborhood, which is just east of downtown, uh, very close to the, the I-70 curve there. We also did these reports on the inside. So you can look at a building from the outside and not know what's really happening on the inside. So we looked at plumbing, permits, electrical. We looked at inspections, anything that we could uh, get gleaned from information about the inside of the property, any kind of issues related to the property. This is the, uh, yeah. Say that again. The question is, why did Kansas City believe in the diversity of housing when it was originally built? Because we had to. Uh, that was the market. This was this was the 1920s, early part of the 20th century. Uh, really, zoning really hadn't taken hold. So you don't, you know, the Supreme Court in 1926 decided Euclid versus Ambler, which was the big stamp of approval for single family zoning. So prior to that time period, uh, this is how cities were built. And it was walkable because not everyone had a car. It was still a streetcar city where a lot of people were, uh, you know, getting to work by walking or taking public transit. And it was just built in, the density was built in because there was a need for a variety of housing. Um, in fact, one of the first parks and boulevards that was built in the city designed by George Kessler was Benton Boulevard. And if you look at Benton, you'll see large, beautiful mansion style homes. And on the same street, you know, a few houses down, you'll have an apartment building. There was really no class segregation at all at that time. And there wasn't the theory that, um, you know, that segregation by housing type was good. It was just, there was a need for all kinds of housing types. Yeah, I 
There were, yeah, there were thousands of small developers. So they might, they might get into the business and build out a whole block. They might, you know, uh, it's really not until after you see like Levitt Town and the Nichols Company, and even at more after World War II that you get that mass production and the application of, uh, you know, assembly line ideas to the production of large, you know, um, subdivisions with the same kind of house. Right, so this was many, many smaller builders, which does create issues of quality, it creates issues of, of materials, uh, but it's certainly diversity is, is certainly built in. You may remember the Central City Economic Development Sales Tax. If you were a voter in Kansas City, Missouri, you were asked to vote on this in uh, 2017, it passed. And what this did was it created a one eight cent sales tax for the entire city where the fund would benefit the neighborhoods uh, basically of the Prospect Corridor from 9th Street to uh, 75th Street, actually to Gregory. So these are the neighborhoods here. Again, this is just east of downtown. It's actually east of Truce. The, the western boundary is Paseo. The eastern boundary is Indiana, and it goes from 9th Street to Gregory. So parts of 18 different neighborhoods. It is uh, a predominantly African-American district historically and today, about 50,000 people living there as of 2020. Uh, you can see the, the median household income relative to the city, relative to the county, relative to the metropolitan statistical area, and relative to Johnson County, Kansas. These numbers here are obviously skewing the, the MSA overall. So when you put these folks here into an area median income with these folks here, that's where a lot of the problems of defining affordable for these folks is rooted in the, the income segregation of the region. Um, so we have a significant uh, concentration of poverty, families in poverty. Um, there are about just under 20,000 housing units. About 5,000 of those of all types were vacant at the time of our survey and about 83% of those are other vacant. And why that's important is that category means what, students? Didn't think I was gonna put you on the spot, did you? Other vacant is, these are just residential properties, Brian? It means they're not for rent and they're not for sale. They are other vacant. And usually that category is where you find abandoned and vacant properties that people have walked away from. So they're not currently under construction. They're not being renovated. They're not for rent or for sale. They're literally vacant. We don't know why, which usually means they may be a foreclosure. They might be an abandoned house. They could be in limbo in terms of the title. The family could be working out who really owns it because grandma passed away before she made the title clear. So there's all kinds of reasons why, but that's problematic because as that number goes up, generally it means there's, uh, there's problems in the housing market. You don't want that, that, that kind of vacancy, right? Because it means it's off market for a much longer time. Dean? Of the 50, of the 5,000, of the 5,000. Yeah, yeah, it's 83% of those vacant units. Um, the the 5,438, that's the total vacancy, which is still, I mean, that's, it's it's a ton of vacant properties, yes. For that 83%, yeah, they, they could often be in tax limbo if, if people can still be paying taxes on a vacant property. If they stop paying taxes, that's where the process of then um, going into the tax foreclosure at the county. And then it, if, if no one buys it at the county steps, then it goes into the land bank and then the land bank tries to then resell the property. And that's usually where we start to get in some real, some real troubles. Okay, it is a renter uh, occupied area in terms of the majority. Um, that's much lower owner occupancy. Uh, than, than the United States in general. You can see the median gross rents from 2019 were just under $800 a month. 
Uh, and again, um, about half the people in the district are experiencing some kind of housing cost burden. Again, this these neighborhoods uh, live this legacy of, of mostly of redlining. South of Brush Creek, there's a few neighborhoods that weren't as redlined. You see Blue Hills here, but even Blue Hills, a neighborhood we've worked with quite a bit, suffers from current day challenges like a very high eviction rate. So while they may not be entirely burdened by the history of redlining, there are certainly other factors, but the vast majority of these neighborhoods uh, were redlined, which means they had a lack of access to capital really built in over the last 100 years. Okay, so we found about 2000 small apartment units uh, in many different buildings throughout. You can see some examples, what we call a two family flat, one unit here, a second unit on the second floor, a threeplex with a unit on each floor, or these six to 12 unit buildings, which really can vary depending on uh, how they're laid out on the inside. They could be um, packed, so you've got a few units on either side on the front and two units on the back, or sometimes people will have the whole floor. Just depends on how they've been laid out inside. Uh, majority of the ownership was actually local or regional. What we found was that there were a lot of owners who were in the same zip code as the building. And that was a bit of a shock. We didn't go into it expecting that these, these small buildings would be owned by a lot of local folks. The, the good side of that is you can work with those folks. You can identify them, you can reach out to them, you can build a program around how can they be more effective landlords, how can they make sure those buildings are up to code and that they're healthy buildings. Uh, the challenge is that might mean that they are doing this as a side job. Um, they might be a landlord and have a few extra units. Um, we found in other cities that sometimes a landlord lives in the building. So in cities like Chicago, Baltimore and New York, this is actually a way that some people uh, pay for their own housing is by buying one of these and living in it and renting out the other unit. And in fact, that really was a time honored tradition with the duplex in the United States, uh, where that's, that's the way that working class folks often get into home ownership is by buying a building, living in it, renting out the other unit, building capital to eventually then they can move out and buy their own house and they can rent out both of these. That option really has declined over the last 50 to 60 years as fewer of these units have been built. These are historic buildings with unique challenges. You can see there's a lot of brick, for example, on this one. Oftentimes there's stonework here. Uh, they tend to need, when you're gonna work on them, you can't just work on them with a ladder. You need some kind of a lift. So all these problems kind of contribute to the challenges of maintenance, especially for the small local owners. We also found a big problem of demolition without replacement. So a lot of times the city talks about vacant lots and the problem of vacant lots in the city, and we don't know what was there before. And in many cases, it used to be an apartment building. So in one neighborhood, we found that it, the reason why home ownership had gone up was because most of these had been demolished. It wasn't because home ownership had gone up, it's because we demolished our way into a neighborhood with basically nobody left except for the single family homeowners. So there, there is a big challenge of losing these buildings and that loss of affordable housing stock. It undermines neighborhood stability. Uh, it increases housing insecurity. We have problems with absentee property owners. It is a problem. And when we looked at the building permits, we found that the demolition permit was the most common kind of building permit uh, in the central city economic development. So we call this demolition without replacement. Oftentimes the goal of demolition is to remove blight, but if you're not putting something back in its place, you've reduced the population, you've reduced the safety of the neighborhood, there's fewer people to keep an eye on it, and you have more problems of maintaining lots like this over time. Okay, what do we do after we finish the study? We recommended that the city create a pilot program uh, to increase the use of historic tax credits. One of the architects we talked with, Elizabeth Rosen, said that St. Louis was doing a much better job than Kansas City in using historic tax credits, and we could really create an incubator to get more uh, folks using those. We also re recommended expanding the minor home repair program 
to include small apartment buildings. Right now, they're not eligible to participate in the minor home repair program because that program is written for single family units. But these smaller buildings, especially the two, three, and four unit buildings are considered residential properties. It's not until you have five units that a property is considered a commercial real estate property. So we recommended to the city to expand that to include small apartments. We also recommended better coordination between the city's housing department and the health department. A few years ago, the health department created the Healthy Homes Program. If a renter calls and asks the health department to come in, the health department can go into a unit and do an inspection. They don't need a, a warrant. They have in many ways more powers uh, than the police. They can go in and look at all the housing issues in a unit and then they can notify the landlord of what needs to be addressed. The attempt here was to get the, the, the healthy homes to be a way that tenants could say, hey, I have a problem in my unit without being evicted for complaining to the landlord. But there's, there's a lot of opportunity there to make it even more effective. Our study did help increase the visibility of these properties. It was picked up by a lot of press. We were on the radio. Uh, but that led to some confusion. People thought, oh, well, you know, if these, house, if these housing units are vacant, can we just, you know, turn them into housing for the homeless? And the answer is no, not really. It's, it's, it's a tough unit already. Usually it's historic. You need to put more money into it. So it's not going to just automatically be a solution for homelessness. Um, there are, it's going to take a much more coordinated approach to address the issue of homelessness. And as you'll see with this property here, which burned during the course of our study, these units are already vulnerable to people breaking in uh, and they really need to be uh, conserved and protected while they are vacant. So there are different challenges here in terms of city housing policy. It's one thing to say this is very important housing. It's another thing when you look at the, the way that the city hands out incentives it's often oriented towards somebody building a brand new building, not towards restoration, not towards uh, preserving these smaller buildings. So they're often missing from the public policy uh, debate. And I would say there's even a bias towards new construction. When you look at the conversation amongst council, they're often talking about uh, some new incentive for some sexy new project downtown, as opposed to the sort of everyday work of maintaining what we already have. It's just not as as flashy. Okay, what are we currently working on? These young folks in the room here with us today are currently doing a study of the South Round Top neighborhood. This is some of their work. This neighborhood is just on the other side of the CCE boundary. So it's outside of the Central City Economic Development District and therefore it doesn't have those, those resources available from uh, the, the tax program. This is right over by Central High School. So this is Indiana here, 31st, I-70 here, 27th on the north. Uh, it's a great little neighborhood, kind of out of the way, beautiful little spot, historic neighborhood. Uh, we've been finally mostly, mostly single family homes. We actually haven't found a lot of small apartment buildings in our current survey. Students are out there, here we are pointing at things as, as, as we're known to do as planners. Uh, and we're looking at everything from the roof to the foundation, windows, doors, siding, uh, and just trying to get a sense of what is needed in this neighborhood. This neighborhood has been identified as a target area for targeted housing improvement to stabilize the neighborhood. Lots of great folks. Uh, this is the neighborhood president, Irving Graham. We're out surveying on Monroe. You'll see us there with all of our papers and our tablets surveying. Uh, and getting the current housing conditions. The goal is for these folks to come up with a strategy to help the neighborhood stabilize what housing uh, we have and to work with the neighborhood to prioritize limited funds to help protect the housing that they have and to create a strategy moving forward so the neighborhood can remain affordable, so folks can stay in their homes, so we can avoid the kinds of problems we've seen uh, with the lack of investment in existing housing. Okay, questions, comments, thoughts. There's my presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Great, great question. So the question was, what happens to the CCED money? Um, there is a CCED board, and that includes uh, an appointee by the mayor, by the school district, by Jackson County, all the taxing jurisdictions were uh, allowed to nominate people to be on the board. It's a five person board and uh, that board makes decisions on funding. They have a strategic plan, which is very clear on what, you know, what can be funded. Um, and they're literally giving out millions of dollars for different projects. So uh, one example is the Santa Fe neighborhood, which is a, historic, a national historic district, which is down at 27th and Benton, uh, just on the other side of, of South Roundtop, actually. Uh, they have a program to help uh, homeowners fix up their home. And they applied, I think it was about an $800,000 or $900,000 fund that they applied to create. Um, I think I want to say that uh, we're five years in and there's five more years to go on the sales tax before it would have to be reapproved. And I, I think we're talking in the scope of maybe like a $10 million fund. So they're, they're, they're doing it project by project. People have to apply. Um, they have some priorities in terms of what they want to fund. And so they've gotten things like daycare, new daycare buildings built on the transit line. Uh, they have funded uh, direct assistance to folks during COVID to kind of help people get through uh, the instability that was caused by you know, public health measures. But most of it is physical development, either on the residential or the commercial side. And they're not paying 100% of a project. They're usually helping to subsidize or provide capital for a project that has other sources of funding. So are these um, grants or loans? Um, I know in Savannah, for example, the city government is subsidizing people to keep their houses painted so they have that wonderful charm sure, <laughs> and it's not sure. run down. So are these people getting outright um, or individual um, grants or is it project-based? I, I don't think it is project-based. I haven't heard of, I mean, except for the direct relief during COVID, I haven't heard of grants. I've heard of um, loans and matching funds, people being able to apply for um, low cost loans or no cost loans to then, but I haven't heard of, the, the Santa Fe may be some grant and some loan. Uh, I'm not sure on how they structured that. Uh, we work with the neighborhood leader. In fact, the neighborhood leader is coming to talk to our our class tomorrow night. Uh, so I'll probably know more tomorrow, but that may be some grant and some very, very low cost loans. Uh, it may depend on income, you know, whether you're eligible for an outright grant or not. But, it, it, you know, because it's city money, it, the cool thing about it is they can write the rules for it. It's not federal money. A lot of federal mo money comes with a lot of restrictions for good reason, of course, but sometimes that makes it tough to do work in predominantly low income neighborhoods and to make things pencil out in terms of you know, the cost. So by having capital that's not restricted by the state or federal government, it does allow the city to do things it couldn't otherwise do, like funding projects to help people fix up their homes and being able to write that off or you know, have a revolving loan fund. So it does, it allows more creative you know, problem solving because you're not, you know, you don't have to follow some federal policy. And then um, with your historic tax credits, um, define historic. <laughs> okay, so um, historic, there are uh, a couple different definitions. Um, from a federal perspective, if a property is listed on a national historic register, that means there's usually been a survey of that historic property it's either being individually listed or listed as part of a district or as a landmark. And it's gonna go through local, state and federal review. And there's a keeper of that National Historic Register list in Washington, DC, usually under the Department of Interior, they handle the historic preservation list and they keep kind of the overall list. Then individual cities can be registered as a certified local government, which means they have the, 
the professional training they need to do that preservation work locally. Kansas City, Missouri is a certified local government. And we also have our own Kansas City Historic Register. So that's a separate list that's managed by the city. It's, it's under planning, under Historic Preservation Commission. We have a commission that meets monthly to review cases, both to add new properties onto that list or to manage existing properties. The Kansas City list is more restrictive than the National Historic List. You can be the owner of a National Historic building and you can demolish it. National Historic Register doesn't have a lot of teeth. Local registers and local listings are usually where the teeth are. In yeah. Kansas City, if a property is on the Kansas City Historic Register, there's an 18 month wait if someone applies for a demolition permit with the goal of trying to get them not to demolish the property. Right? Okay, okay. okay. No, keep it, keep it on and use it. Otherwise people right. can't. You're up oh. next. Uh, Jacob, uh, just a, a kind of a quick question yes is uh for the the you being with the university and doing this kind of stuff is con seems to be consistent with the university's goals is to become part of the of the city right rather than being a separate bunch right. of academics right. and uh so my my question really is uh do you feel like you're getting ad adequate support from the university in doing this um we meet with our new dean dean truman next week and uh, we're very excited about our new um, academic home. We're very optimistic that we won't have to explain what we do anymore. Um, sometimes I think being planners, being very practical minded in the College of Arts and Sciences, sometimes people looked at us and like, why are you guys here? Um, but you know, you see from our work, it involves history. It involves research on the culture. It involves all kinds of what we might call humanities, but then we're also trained as social scientists. All my colleagues are trained as social scientists, but we're practicing urban planners. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever have the, the best academic home anywhere. Uh, we, we do what we do, we're a professional program. Civil engineering understands that, uh, the Dean understands that. It's applied research, as you saw, most of this was uh, you know, very much about public policy. It's not just of course, we're working on a journal article to follow up and talk about what we did and put in the context. Um, we've had great support from the state of Missouri for the Center for Neighborhoods. And so as long as we can maintain that support, we're, we're good to go. I, oh, oh, okay. I, I'll, I'll get it to you in a moment. Uh, I, as, I, as I understand it, one of the problems in the, uh, in the uh, in, 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 well, now actually, and in the future, yeah, is is starter homes for young for yes. for, for younger people. Absolutely. Um, and is there uh, there's you know I understand wanting to preserve all the uh, the historic structures, the beautiful structures, right? But there's also a lot of vacant lots around. Yes. Is there a program to start building something? I, I think you had something. Uh, um, one of the um, middle spaces is called something like a courtyard. Uh -huh. cottages or something like right. that is there some idea to build some smaller homes like that that maybe some young people can afford someday <laughs> um that's a great question um you know the small bungalows that often provide the context for these small apartment buildings those are your quote unquote tiny homes or small affordable starter homes of the 1920s 30s 40s etc um, and, you know, it's just very expensive to build new. One of the benefits of building in the city is you already have the existing infrastructure, sidewalks, schools, transit, all that. But even then, sometimes there's, you know, compounding costs. I have not seen anybody taking it to scale. You need the planning to happen so you know where are the vacant lots that we could do an infill project in. The city's working on becoming more amenable for a diversity of housing on the existing lots. There's work right now to revise chapter 88 of the city code. And that chapter 88 is the zoning and you know, development code. And they're trying to allow more infill more quickly to try to make it easier to do small minor subdivisions of up to maybe like 20 units at a time and I think the thought there is we have all these vacant lots, so let's get people building. The problem with the vacant lots is you don't know what's underground. Ask any of your environmental engineers around here. Um, 
you know, you have to do a survey and figure out when they demolish the home, which is probably what was there before, um, did they put the house in the foundation and cover it up with dirt? Or did they take the house and remove it and then fill it up where it could be developed again? One of the false subsidies that's causing a lot of problems is we say demolition is cheaper than preservation, but that's because we're not counting in the environmental costs of what happens after the demolition. Um, and one of the projects we were working on with some folks from economics a few years ago was about childhood lead poisoning. You know, and there's research that shows that demolitions create, especially in older neighborhoods, can often create childhood lead blood poisoning just because of the contamination of the air and the soil from demolishing buildings that are have all kinds of lead. So we're really not as a society keeping track. And so it looks like a demolition is cheap, you know, $15,000 as opposed to a restoration for $50,000, but we're not taking in all the costs of what happens after the demolition, including just building a new home on that property. So, you know, we're in favor of both. We need to see small, you know, new starter homes being built, but we also need to make sure we're, you know, maintaining what we have. I think Deb had a question for me. Um, it's related to what Ed just asked. My question is about architectural yes. consistency. And so if somebody was gonna come in and say, build a small thing, will, will it have to be architecturally consistent? <laughs> um, a few years ago, I think it was 2013, 14, there was a neighborhood over here called Mannheim. And there was this guy named Brad Pitt and he thought, well, we're going to do what we did in New Orleans, and we're going to have this sort of uh, restoration project here in Kansas City. And some of the architects and landscape architects who worked with them in New Orleans came back to Kansas City, and they were proposing infill housing. And they, what they did was they took the classic bungalow, and they just brought it up to the 21st century. Those six or seven designs are sitting there, and anybody could pick them up and build them. Uh, and I would say most neighborhoods would be happy to have that new construction. Occasionally, you know, you get more modern or, or different kinds of materials or whatever. And, um, but with this, we're not so much concerned about um, architectural consistency. And some people want the new units to look like they speak to the present as opposed to the past. So it really depends on the neighborhood. Some neighborhoods really don't care. They just want new housing. They need, they have people who need housing. Uh, it doesn't mean you want it to be, you know, the, the slums of the 21st century, what you're building is gonna fall apart, you know, in five or 10 years. But then there's so much material change now. I think even Habitat for Humanity is looking at all kinds of new technologies and training on the latest technologies of how to do different kinds of construction. So in a lot of ways we need to go with, you know, does it fit in terms of massing and scale? Is it set back the same amount from the street? You know, does it fit with the surrounding neighborhood houses in terms of size or context, as opposed to, you know, architectural aspects? So we're usually focused on massing and scale rather than, you know, design or ornamentation. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, I'm, I'm curious about the missing middle. Um, if I understood you correctly, zoning wasn't an issue when all of that um, diversity of housing was being built. And now that we have zoning, that's an impediment. I'm curious in Prairie Village, what, what the opposition to diversity of housing types is and all of that you know just kind yeah. of that whole issue um i was over at the prairie village jazz festival a few weeks ago and i had the unfortunate situation of standing next to the mayor while someone came up and i wouldn't say talk to him about it um and the two things that i could glean from that conversation 
was there's a fear that it will reduce the value of the existing single family homes. And then there's some strange notion that somehow the schools will be overcrowded. And I, I'm thinking to myself, well, Johnson County has been demolishing elementary schools. So I don't think the overcrowded schools is gonna be a problem. It's just not. You're, if you look at the data, the, the population, both demographically, it's just going down. So having new families move in with kids is a good thing, right? So that I didn't understand. The value thing, again, values are go have gone through the roof. People are buying up, you know, two, $300,000 homes and demolishing them, you know, and building a, a half a million dollar home. And it's just, I mean, it's so, so it's, it's, it's pushing to more and more expensive. I think some of the pushback is actually the folks who probably live in a smaller home next to a, you know, a demolished, big, huge McMansion. And some of their frustration is with that. But this is the current policy change that's in front of them. So they're putting all their energy of attacking this zoning change. In talking with the mayor and planners and other folks over there, the goal was to diversify the housing stock and to allow people in this moment where you are having teardowns to have an option where, well, if they're gonna replace this single family unit, what if we replace it with two or three or four units? And that's where people start to freak out because they associate that with, they're gonna lose property values. Now, clearly there's probably a racial component to that as well. For some people, they don't want a more diverse neighborhood flat out. But you know, the United States and our region is just gonna become more diverse. The growingest population is young Latino families. That's just a demographic fact. So, and, and I see that as a good thing. So I can't, I can't help folks out if, if that's the issue. Um, but fair housing is a national policy backed by the president, the Congress and the courts. And fair housing is part of federal housing policy to this very day. And the goal is for every municipality to participate in affirmatively furthering fair housing, which means municipalities in Johnson County need to be part of the solution just as much as Kansas City, Missouri or KCK or anywhere else. And so this is a really interesting moment. My fear is that the policy debate and the issues of how to do it well are getting lost in the emotion of don't do it at all, right? Oh, um, some, uh, some time ago, Deb O'Bannon took us of a tour of uh, rain gardens in Marlboro, oh. in Marlboro. Oh, great. Yeah. To re that reduce the amount of pollutants that flow into the Little yes. Blue River. Is that factored in in any of your development considerations? Well, this team right here is after they get done with the housing survey, they may need to talk to Deb O'Bannon about what to do with all the vacant lots in, in South Round Top. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot. Um, I mean, there are not a lot of vacant lots in South Round Top. I thought we would find more. Um, there's maybe one or two, sometimes four on a block, which compared to what I've surveyed in other neighborhoods is, is you know, here and there, there's a few vacant lots. What we found is a very mature tree canopy, which comes with a lot of challenges for people who don't have a lot of money to manage a mature tree canopy. In fact, we surveyed one block on Monroe. We came back a week later and there was a hole in the roof and this huge tree had fallen into, and there just the hole was enormous. So there are challenges there with, with tree canopy. Um, but as far as water management, we're we're not there yet. We'll, we're gonna we're gonna follow up with Deb O'Bannon here if, if she wants to come out of retirement and help us out. Um, but we of course are considering rain gardens and green infrastructure as we look at the next phase of what to do with the vacant lots. Um, we're not sure what the flooding looks like. Some of the, in our first neighborhood meeting, uh, the neighbors told us which storm drains don't drain fast enough. And they happen to be in a low point in the neighborhood and they happen to be right next to a huge vacant lot. So maybe there's some opportunities there. Um, so we'll see. It's it's definitely on our mind as we look at the next phase of our of our neighborhood plan. Well, thank you all for your time. We got to get out and survey some houses. So we're, we're going to get back thank to you. class. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you.